Friday, April the 27th. We arrived at Gatwick on the Thursday morning and spent the night at Olive and Lynn's. On Friday morning, the four of us were all packed and ready for our adventure. We left Biggin Hill around 10 a.m. and by the time we reached the high street, you could hear Lynn singing, Here we go! Here we go! We were on our way to Bardington Wharf Acton Bridge, Ursula's new home. We arrived at the wharf at 3.30, stowed our gear, and around 5 o'clock we were heading down the Trent and Mersey. Silver ribbons are running right across the land, they're coming back to the water. Feel the old tiller moving in your hand, they're coming back to the water. Yes, we were back on the cut. Not long after we took off, I went through Salterford's tunnel without our headlights on. Not recommended. Pat decided that it would be a smart move if she took charge of going through the 572-yard Barnton tunnel. We moored up at Marston on our first night and had a very nice meal at the salt barge. Also, Old Speckled Hem was only a pound seventy-five a pint. Saturday, April the 28th. In the morning we gave Ursula a bit of spit and polish, and then at lunchtime went over to the salt barge for a pint. About 1.30 they opened up the Lion Salt Works, and so we took a very interesting tour around it. They are hoping to get a grant to continue their restoration project, and we wish them all the best. Our mooring tonight was at the scenic Croxton Flash. These lagoons, or flashes as they are called, are the result of subsidence from the extraction of salt brine. Not uncommon to see the hulk of an abandoned barge or narrowboat in them. Hey John, should I tell the girls to get the dinner ready? What? We've got to cook your dinner? Up yours. Sunday, April the 29th. After breakfast we cruised for an hour or so down to the big lock in Middlewich. Graham and Lynn, Ophelia owners, drove over from Macclesfield and joined us for Sunday dinner at the pub. After Sunday dinner, Graham and Lynn joined us for an afternoon cruise. We stopped and bought some flowers from the old fella who has moored across from Middlewich Narrowboats for a number of years. We then chatted with the lady at Wardle Lock Cottage. We met both the old fella and the lock lady during our travels in 93. Graham and Lynn left us as soon after we turned onto the Middlewich branch, or as some people call it, the Wardle Canal. We moored up for the night in open countryside near Church Minchel. Monday, April 30th. We were up and underway by 6.30 a.m. and arrived at Barbridge Junction before 7.30. We'd been out for a couple of days, so it was time to top up the water tank. We made a left turn onto the Shropshire Union Canal towards Wolverhampton. We were only on the Shropshire for about one and a quarter miles before turning onto the Langarthlin Canal at Hurlston Junction. And here's Lynn giving some high fives after making a successful turn at Hurlston Junction. In a world that moves too quickly, there's a refuge for the sane. When the load becomes too heavy, all your day is filled with pain. You can measure out the silence in a cup of any size, or travel any distance where the speed is not the prize. Yes, we're ready for the scenic Langarthland Canal. Most of the canals still had foot and mouth disease restrictions. 
The first section of the Langarthlin from Bridge 6 to 20, which is Renbury, had Stage 2, which meant that we were not allowed to moor up or stop on that part of the canal. Here at Renbury, the British Waterways staff are operating the road lift bridge. We moored up for the night near Marbury Lock. Pat and I took an afternoon stroll around the village, and then in the evening the four of us had dinner at the Swan. Tuesday, May the 1st. We had a lazy morning and didn't get underway until about 10.30. So you moor up your boat and it's off with your coat Down at the pub on the court Yes, we moored up the boat for the pub on the cut But we had to wait an hour for the wily moor to open Then we had a much deserved pint The first of quite a few And no, I don't have to go potty After quenching our thirst a bit, we decided to have lunch at the pub, and it was very good. Pat had a nice piece of cod. We chatted with the landlady, who's lived there for 22 years, and she told us stories of seating snobbish customers in the part of the bar that was, at one time, the loo. During the three-plus hours that we were at the Wiley Moor, we only saw one boat go through the lot. It's really surprising how light the traffic is on the Langarthlin. Foot and mouth notices were posted throughout the canal system. This one was at Grinley Brook Lock. Whenever we stepped onto the towpath, we had to disinfect our feet before returning to the boat. British Waterways had installed disinfectant mats at all the locks to help with this procedure. The restored Whitchurch arm is to the left of the lift bridge. We took a quick look up there but decided to leave this stop for our return journey. So we continued on and moored up for the night at Fens Wood. After dinner we had a game of cards. The Whitchurch arm had not been restored when Bob and Annette bid their farewells to us in June of 1993. You can just see the lift bridge on the upper left of the photograph. Wednesday, May the 2nd. After a nice big breakfast, we cruised through Wixall Moss to Priest Junction. I understand that they still gather peat from the mosses in this area. We decided to make the short trip up the half mile long Priest Branch to Wixall Marina. And here's Len doing an excellent job of making the turn. The branch never did reach Priest, and it is sometimes known as the Ed Staxton branch. The lift bridges on the Priest have not been mechanised and have to be pulled up and down by hand. Actually, there are only two bridges on the branch, and one of them, Starks, is permanently locked in the up position. Come on, Pat. Get some weight into it. Here is a shot of Ormond's lift bridge on this tranquil portion of the canal system. Pat was captain on the return journey down the Priest Branch. We have travelled 19 miles and gone through 19 locks since we left Hurlston Junction. Actually, we've gone 43 miles and gone through 27 locks since we left Acton Bridge. As the caption says, we'll take a left and head up to Langothlin. Only 25 and a half mile and two locks. We moored up for the night at one of our favourite spots, Blake Mere. Unfortunately, the rhododendrons were not yet in bloom. In about two weeks, this will be a blaze of colour. Oh yes, I misplaced one of our mooring irons 
but old Eagle Eye Lynn found it for us. Friday, May the 3rd. We arrived at Ellesmere Basin early in the morning. We did some shopping at the co-op and visited Pete's Sandwich Bar for a bacon buddy and a cuppa. It was only 33p a cup. In the afternoon, the ladies checked out the antique and thrift shops, while Len and I popped into the bookie shop. We had an 11 to 2 and a 12 to 1 winner, and a 20 to 1 third. But, but, but. In the evening, we had a pint at the White Hart, and then had an excellent dinner at the Black Lion. Saturday, May the 4th. We decided that today would be a full day of cruising. Len took us out of Ellesmere Basin around 8 a.m. No, John, I didn't buy you your very own narrowboat. While we were watering up at the BW Yard in Ellesmere, we ran into the owners of narrowboat John James. They had just had it repainted. The canal had breached at Martin Locks a couple of weeks before our arrival. Fortunately, British Waterways had repaired it for us. Although there didn't appear to have been any foot-of-mouth outbreaks in this area, we did pass some farms that had been culled, and it was a very sorry sight. Obviously, Clara Bell escaped the math inspector. Shortly after I had a wee droppy on this pretty part of the canal, we stopped off at the Poacher's Pocket for a pint and lunch. We had a good meal at £2.95 apiece. Opened in 1891, the Chirk Aqueduct and the adjacent Great Railway Viaduct crosses the English Welsh border. As you cruise across the aqueduct, you are 70 feet above the River Kirog. It was really nice to cruise this canal with so little traffic. It gave us plenty of time for photo opportunities. I think a copy of this photo is going to end up on the I Love Me wall. As the caption says, Ursula seems to be chugging along, finding her own way to Chirk Tunnel. The tunnel is 459 yards long, and has a towpath inside it. This gave me the chance to take a different type of tunnel shot. We're going through the tunnel, push boys, push. We're saving this old tunnel, push boys, push. Pat really does seem relaxed as she's taken us through the tunnel. Push boys, push. Push boys, push. Push boys, push. After the short 191 yard long White House tunnel, the railway veers off to the north on the magnificent Newbridge Viaduct. The canal now enters Offa's Dyke country. Offa was King of Messiah from 757 to 796 AD, and he built a defensive dyke to protect his western boundaries. Finally, Telford's masterpiece comes into view, the Pontesildi Aqueduct, certainly one of the wonders of the waterways. It is over 1,000 foot long and carries the canal 127 feet above the River Dee. It consists of an iron trough supported by 18 stone piers. The aqueduct was completed in 1805 and it is ranked as one of Telford's most outstanding achievements. It doesn't matter how many times you do it, 
It is always the highlight of a canal trip to cross the Ponte Sordi Aqueduct. On the right side of the boat is the towpath, a pedestrian walkway across the aqueduct. However, on the left it's about four inches wide. One step over this, and it's more than 120 foot down to the River Dee. In the summer months, the Ponte Sildi can be chaos, with boaters getting frustrated trying to get across the aqueduct. Once again, we were so fortunate. There was only one boat in sight, and that was going the same direction as us, and he was at the far end of the aqueduct. This gave us plenty of time to look at the scenery and take our photos. Unlike the Titanic, Ursula will not hit an iceberg. After the excitement of Ponte Sildi, we made a left turn at Trevor and started cruising the beautiful Vale of Langoflin. The canal sidles along tree-covered hillsides with nice views down into the Vale. Never exactly wide, the canal narrows to a one-way system as we approach Langoflin. The section from Langoflin to Trevor was never designed for canal traffic. It was constructed to provide water from the River Dee at Lanticillo to the original canal terminus at Trevor. We have reached our final destination, Langoflin. The canal does continue on for about another two miles, but it is not navigable beyond this point. We moored up around 7 p.m. We were fortunate to get a prime location with a nice view of the town. In the evening we walked around and finally decided to have a meal at the Benson Hotel. While I had a nice view of the river, I have to say it was the worst meal that we had on the entire trip. Langothlin is famous for its singing Eisteddfel. However, it does have other attractions, one of them being one of the Seven Wonders of Wales, the Langothlin Bridge, built in 1347 by John Trevor. Saturday, May the 5th, our second week. After a lazy morning, we caught the 12.30 train for a very interesting eight-mile journey up the spectacular Dee Valley to the village of Cowdog. Our steam train was the Magpie, the old LMS number 44806. By the way, round-trip senior tickets were only £5.50 each. One of the things that made this an interesting trip was that everything was restored to how it was in the early 50s. And as you can see here, we have one of the old timers giving a hand with our luggage. All aboard! All aboard! Even the carriages were restored to how they looked in the 50s. Just as the caption says, Olive and Len are going on a choo-choo ride. And so are we. We couldn't have asked for better weather to see this beautiful countryside. Now here's an interesting shot. Are we really parting ways? On May the 2nd, 1996, Carrick Station reopened to passengers after being closed for 31 years. Faithfully restored by volunteers back to its former 1950s glory, it's a perfect example of a Great Western Railway Country Branch Line station. Just a short walk from the railway station and over the historic bridge built in 1661 is the pretty village of Karog. The white building above the centre of the bridge is the Grouse Pub, and of course this is where we had our lunchtime pint. 
I took a stroll into the village and took a snap of the store and post office. No big supermarkets here. While having a pint at the grouse, we decided to walk back one station to GLY NDY FRDWY. I can't pronounce it. It was about a three mile walk. As we strolled along the country lanes, the magpie met us on her way up to Kaurog. She was scheduled to be back at our station at 3.12. It was a pleasant afternoon stroll, and Len and I arrived at the station at 3.10. Plenty of time to spare. The magpie is scheduled to be at this nicely restored station in two minutes' time. Come on, girls, hurry up. The train's coming. You're going to miss it. Run! Well, they arrived at 3.15. Luckily, Magpie was three minutes late today. By the way, where's that red coat Olive had at the beginning of the walk? She dropped it on the way somewhere. In the evening, we had a very nice meal at Jenny Jones. Excellent leek and potato soup. They even had an enjoyable seven-piece band playing Dixieland jazz. Sunday, May the 6th. Wake up, you lazy buggers! Pat and I are going to take a stroll up to Horseshoe Falls. The water in the feeder system was crystal clear, and we could see lots of good-sized fish. They look like trout. It's about four miles up and back to the falls. Quack, quack. Quack, quack. The River Dee and the canal feeder system run side by side on the way up to Horseshoe Falls. The river is diverted into a valve house at the falls, and this provides the water for the canal. The outlet from the valve house is in front of where Pat is sitting. And as the caption says, here is the world famous Horseshoe Falls, very similar to those at Niagara. On our way back, we stopped off at the Chainbridge Hotel and had a nice full English breakfast. However, it did cost us £6.50 each. One of the attractions at Langartland is to take a horse-drawn barge up to Horseshoe Falls and then catch the train back to town. Here's old Fred, born in 1971 and still going strong. We left Langartland around noon and slowly started making our way back. Of course we had to check out the Sun Trevor and have a lunchtime pint. Another one of our favourite moorings is located between the Church Tunnel and Aqueduct. We were surprised no other boats were there. In the evening, Pat and I walked into the village and had a pint at the hand. We were going to have a meal there, but we decided we weren't very hungry, so we returned to the boat for a delicious baked beans on toast dinner. Monday... 7th of May. Good morning, dear. I'm going for a stroll. See you later. In the shining of still waters, not a ripple can be seen to mark the passing of another day. certainly had still waters on the Chirk Aqueduct in this bright sunny morning. The smoke in the background is from the Cadbury's Chocolate Factory, located just outside the village. The early morning sun really brought out the beauty of the Kirog Valley. Unlike Langartland, Chirk Station is on the main line. 
and it's very convenient for picking up any passengers joining canal boats. Just like George and Georgina did on the 5th of June 1993. The plan was to spend the morning at Chirk Castle, so I decided to take a walk up there and check out the opening times, etc. The photo says it all. There were a number of cattle in the castle grounds and it had to be closed because of the foot and mouth restrictions. We arrived at Jackmintons just before opening time and I helped the landlord open up the bar. Len and I spent the afternoon in the pub's garden playing cribbage and down in a pint or two. Pat and Olive sunned themselves on the boat deck, reading the newspaper and sipping some drinks. Around four o'clock, Graham and Lynn arrived on Ophelia, and we had a get-together on their boat. I helped Graham put a dent in his scotch supply. The six of us had a pleasant dinner at Jack's, chatted with the patrons, and supped some more ale. During the course of the evening, we made various plans to tow Ophelia backwards to the winding hole near Meisterman's, so we could all cruise the Monday tomorrow. There was varying degrees of concern regarding this plan. Tuesday, May the 8th, 5.30 a.m. Yes, 5.30 in the morning. I was up at daybreak and ready to go. However, with a clearer mind, Graham decided it would be better if he went up to Chirk, winded there, and met us at Frankton Junction. The best laid plans of mice and men went by the wayside when Graham found out that he had a dead battery. It turned out to be a dud alternator. This turn of events put the kibosh on our plans to cruise together, and as there wasn't anything we could do to help, we pulled away from Jap Mittens about 6.30 to the sounds of Zampier's pan flute music. We arrived at Frankton Junction around 8.45. The summer lock times are 9.30 to 10.30 in the morning and 2.30 to 3.30 in the afternoon. So we had plenty of time to cook breakfast while we waited for Colin, the lock keeper, to open the locks for us. The last time we visited the Montgomery Canal was in 1993, and this was prior to its restoration. This is how Frankton Locks looked in June 1993. After going through the two lock staircase and the two single locks, we made a turn onto the western branch to top up the water tank. Except for the few yards where the water point is, the western branch is derelict, and as far as I know there are no plans to restore this part of the Montgomery Canal. We took some time out as we went under Lockgate Bridge to show what the canal looked like in 1993. You can see this clearer in the next photograph. And here I am pretending to do some restoration work at Lockgate Bridge in June 1993. Pat doesn't like gorse because once it gets rooted it takes over all the land around it. I think it's kind of pretty. We cruised the four and a half miles of restored canal on Tickover, enjoying the scenery. At the present time, the end of navigation is at the Queen's Head, and we arrived there in plenty of time to have a lunchtime fight. In the evening, we had a very nice dinner at the pub. Pat had wolffish on leek leaves. Wednesday, May the 9th. We pulled away from our moorin opposite the Queen's Head around 7.30, and started heading back towards the Langothlin Canal. In the mid-19th century, a short-lived packet boat service operated between Newton and the Heath Houses, a distance of about 33 miles. This interesting building was a terminal for passengers travelling on the packet boat. 
This inoperable swing bridge is the entrance to the disused trench shipment basin of the Heath Houses. The short arm is sometimes referred to as the Bone Works arm. In its latter years there was a Bone Works in the basin, hence its alias of Bone Works arm. Although designated as a nature reserve, I wonder how long before this becomes another marina. As you can see, the Mundi is 35 miles long, and hopefully one day will be fully restored. The section from Queen's Head to Maysbury Marsh, about two miles, could be opened by the end of this year. But there are some riparian issues that have to be addressed before this can happen. There is also an isolated 10 mile section that has already been restored. It runs from Burgenden Locks, about 10 miles from Maysbury Marsh, to Beru, about 8 miles from Newton. The work of Graham Piggy Palmer led to the restoration of the Mundi and many other waterways. This memorial is located by the lock that is named in his honour. Well, here we are back on the Langoflin Canal. Lem wanted to pick up a toy for his grandson Sam, so we backtracked to Meistermeens. The boatyard has a 56 foot winding hole, and it was a very tight manoeuvre to get Ursula turned around. We were surprised to find very few boats in the arm, and had no problem mooring up there for the night. In the evening we walked into town and had dinner at the horse and jockey. Locals told us we should have tried the Greyhound. We also had a pint at a nice 14th century pub with a friendly landlord. The old something or other. It wasn't the old vaults. Thursday, May the 10th. We got underway around 9am and made a very interesting turn out of the Whitchurch Arm and under the new Mills lift bridge. When we got to Grinley Brook we had to wait for three boats to come up the staircase before we could go down. This is a shot of a very interesting lockkeeper's cottage. The lockkeeper told us about the horrors of summer traffic at Grinley Brook. Delays of three hours or more are normal, and it's even been known for delays of up to nine hours. He told us that one day last year, 110 boats went through the locks. No such delays for us, though. As you come out of the bottom lock, there's a fairly good cross current caused by the bywash. You have to give the boat a good bit of wally to get across it. Oh no, Olive! What have you done? Yes? We are well and truly stuck across the weir at Povey Lock. We tried all sorts of ways to free ourselves. We threw a line off the stern to the towpath and Len and Pat pulled and pulled. Olive got on the side of the boat and rocked it and I mustered up all the muscle power I could to push the stern off. Eventually we got a free anyway. The good news about all this was that we were delayed for a while, so we ended up arriving back at the Wiley Moor pub just in time for lunch and a pint. After that we pushed on and moored up overnight at bridge number three beyond the foot and mouth disease no mooring restriction area. Friday, May the 11th. After giving Ursula a bit of a spit and polish, we got underway and soon reached Halston Locks. We were very fortunate to cruise the Langothlin Canal in such beautiful weather and so little traffic. We didn't plan to stop at the Barbage Inn, but as we went by I saw the boat of my dreams. It was a 60 foot coal craft with a lovely boatman's cabin and a 15,000 pound Russell Newbury engine. Its name was Traveller's Joy. As I looked over, I could identify who the owners were, so we moored up and bought them a pint. They very kindly showed us around the boat, and then I tried to get them to sell it, but didn't have any luck. 
Anyway, we had a nice lunch at the pub. After lunch, we cruised on to this panoramic mooring overlooking Church Minshall. Then we walked through the pretty woods alongside the Weaver River to the village. We had a pint and game of pool at the Badger. Saturday, May the 12th. We had a nice leisurely morning cruise along the Middlewich Branch and up the Trenton Mersey Canal. And if we take it real slow, we might just get by this blue heron. Can you believe that? We actually made it. We stopped off at the Broken Cross for a quick lunchtime pint, and then slowly made our way back to the boatyard. By the second week, the signets were hatching. And as the caption says, here's mum with her six little ones. We arrived back at Bardington Wharf, Acton Bridge, around 4.30pm. Olive and Lynn packed their car and said bye-bye to us. They certainly caught the sun and, I think, had a good time. We moored up for the night in a nice open country setting just beyond the boatyard near Bridge 211. Sunday, May the 13th. After breakfast, we headed up to Lim on the Bridgewater Canal. We had to wait three quarters of an hour at the single-wide Prestonbrook Tunnel because we just missed the northbound time. By the way, these cranes, unique to the Bridgewater, are used to slot the planks across the canal so that a section can be drained for repairs. We had a lunchtime stop at the London Bridge pub in Stockton Heath and then arrived in Lynn around 5 o'clock. We were surprised to see Mike and Bonnie Goldberg on their narrowboat California. We chatted for a while and then moored up across from the Golden Fleece. Of course, we had to go over and check out their beer. In the evening, we both had an excellent Lamb Henry dinner at the Spread Eagle. Around nine o'clock, Mike and Bonnie tapped on the door of Ursula. We reminisced about our canal travels until gone midnight. Monday, May the 14th. It rained heavy during the night and continued to do so throughout the morning. It was ideal weather to decide the 2001 Scrabble Championship. Need I say more? The rain eased up around midday, so we went into town to do a bit of shopping. The town cross dates back to the 17th century, and the steps are worn with age. Around 2 o'clock we started heading back down the Bridgewater Canal. The rain held off for most of the afternoon, but around 6 o'clock we started to get some liquid sunshine and decided to moor up just beyond the Daresbury Science Research Lab. What did they do in that place? We lit the fire and had a cosy evening watching TV. Tuesday, May the 15th. We decided to cruise to Runcorn, new waters for us. The five and three quarter mile long arm was pleasant cruising. There were some nice sections of woods, lots of blue herons that didn't fly off when we passed them, not too bad as far as rubbish in the cut, and there were water lilies with a nice deep channel in the middle. And just to add to it, there was virtually no traffic. Here we are at Waterloo Bridge. This is now the terminus, but prior to 1967 you could lock down to the Mersey River. After winding at the terminus, we moored up close to the old town, and Pat did a bit of shopping in the high street while I went for a stroll down to the waterfront. This is the single span arch bridge that crosses the Manchester Ship Canal and the River Mersey. It's 1,092 foot long. Unfortunately, I didn't get a very good shot of it. Ship had left the slip from this port to Natal. The 
the boats that sail the waters of the Manchester Canal. Ocean-going vessels of up to 15,000 tonnes displacement can use the ship canal. Pleasure craft have to apply to enter and have to meet stringent standards of seaworthiness. They also have to have at least £50,000 third-party insurance. On our way back from Runcorn, we spent a very enjoyable afternoon at the ruins of Norton Priory and the Walled Garden. The Priory dates back to the 12th century, and this photo, viewed in full image, provides an overview of its history. A Georgian mansion was built on the site of the Priory in 1750. Only the undercroft of the Cellarer's Range, the processional doorway, the statue of St. Christopher, and the passageway which led from the courtyard to the cloister remain today. Pat is standing in the 800-year-old passageway. The oldest part of the Priory that remains is the 12th century Norman doorway. However, it was moved to its present location in 1868 to become the main entrance of the mansion. The impressive 11 foot tall statue of St. Christopher carrying the Christ child on his shoulder has been a part of Norton Priory since about 1400 AD. It was probably commissioned by the first abbot to celebrate the Priory's elevation to an abbey in the year 1381. Archaeological excavations began around 1970, and the site opened to the public in 1975. In the late 18th century, the Brooks family built a mansion with lakes and gardens on the grounds of the old priory. The mansion was demolished in 1928, and all that has survived is the two-and-a-half-acre walled garden. In the early 1980s, the garden was restored to an 18th century theme reminiscent of the original design. There are lots of alleyways and arbors throughout the garden. One of its interesting features is the southern facing wall. It has a flue in it and can be heated to aid in the growing of tropical fruits. After our visit to Norton Priory, we headed back to the Trenton Mersey and returned through Prestonbrook Tunnel. We moored up for the night just beyond the southern portal. Wednesday, May the 16th. After a slow morning, we cruised down to Bartington Wharf, filled up with diesel, and replaced the empty Caligas bottle. In the early afternoon, we moored up for the day about a mile south of the boatyard and went on a pub crawl. We ended up at the Holly Bush, where we had dinner. Thursday, May the 17th. We were up at 6 o'clock, packed and tidied up Ursula. Unfortunately, it was belting down with rain, so the outside didn't get its usual treatment. We pulled into Bartington Wharf around 9.30, settled our account, and loaded our gear into the waiting taxi. A very enjoyable cruise had come to an end. And I know that I'll be by To cruise along the waterway, not caring where or when. There's no deadlines, 